I understood that this world that we are living in today is framed for humans to be consumers. That's it. I mean, we are consumers. And when we are labeled as consumers and we are living in this capitalist system where basically the goal is to increment and increase the level of wealth and capital and the rules basically of success. So basically the basics of success is based on fame, money and power. That's the way you want to be framing everything that you do. We are forced to live in this framework and then survive within the framework when we get all these manipulative people that know how to use confrontation, polarization, fear and hate, and then we are just victims of all that stuff. So the question was, oh my goodness, I don't want to live in this world. What can we do? Hey, it's Michael, and this is the Kintsugi Podcast. I'll be back in a minute with this week's conversation about resilience. But first, if you wish to create a better life and have a better career, then please visit michaelobrienshift.com and download your free workbook on how to create a better life. In it, you'll discover ways to find more energy for the things and the people who matter most to you so you can create a better tomorrow. Hey there, it's Michael, and welcome to the Kintsugi Podcast and another conversation about resilience. This week, as we do each week, we have someone special. I met him in 2017 down in Miami, Florida at the World Happiness Summit. Sounds pretty cool, right? The energy was unbelievable. I was there serving as an IPEC coach, a coaching program I'm certified in that has a focus on energy. Our ripple, if you will, because after all, we're all energy. The experience was life-changing for me. It was so good to see so many people coming together to talk about how we can ripple more happiness, love, kindness, and compassion into the world. So our guest is many things, and I love how he described himself. From a traditional sense, he's been a coach, a peace worker, a corporate leader, and the first ripple in something he calls happy which is a beautiful counterbalance to capitalism. He's also the person that created the World Happiness Summit. And now, six years later, it's grown into this beautiful wave that stretches across the planet, putting just the type of ripple we need into the world to help us step in and form our Kintsugi. So if you're ready for this week's conversation about resilience, Settle into a comfortable position. Take a healthy breath in and a slow releasing breath out and get to know Luis Gallardo from the World Happiness Foundation. Ah, Luis, good to see you. (laughs) The same, Michael. I can't wait to dive into this topic of happiness. And so for the listeners, I first found you and your work being an IPAC coach at the 2017 World Happiness Summit down in Miami. And for me, as a coach back then, it was one of the most special, special meetings I had really that whole year. And the the ripple effect from that meeting has remained with me over the last six plus. So I'm super psyched that We are sitting down together today to talk about happiness, um, especially given where the world is at right now. Yes, and I still remember, Mike, it was an amazing energy. I mean, iPad coaches are always full of energy. I think that 
the ripple effect of bringing uh, so many coaches with an incredible community is is being around for so many years. And now we evolved this even further into a festival, the World Happiness Festival, which is a uh, ten times energy. <laughs> so we wow. can talk about okay. that. We need we wow. need that expansion today in the world. So we need as positive as negative going on. Oh, that's so cool. So we're going to put a pin in that. We're going to come back to the, the festival to really get a current day vibe of what you've created from those early days where I got to participate. So before we get to that, though, let's get into knowing you uh, for those that don't know you. So if you had to put your work to the side, like what you do professionally, how would you describe who you are? Yes, this is a. I, I love this question uh, because it's not easy if you haven't done inner work to get into an answer that goes beyond labels. So in this case, uh, I mean the answer, the short answer is I am. Mm, I love that. <laughs> and then we can explore what am um, is, right? And 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 then we can go into different uh, subtle angles. But I will, but I would, the way I want to define myself in this moment is as somebody who has committed to create synarchy in the world. Synarchy is a beautiful world, word. Uh, synarchy is not synergy uh, and it's not anarchy. Uh, synarchy means that social systems work in harmony and balance. So a physical system is the body. When we look at the body, I mean, basically we just need to breathe, get some food and water, and it works. So it's magic. It's synarchic. The body and all living beings and are synarchic. How do you build synarchy of communities? How do you bring together groups of people that actually live in harmony and balance. So that's me. Uh, is somebody committed to creating synergy in the world? I love that word. Oh, that's such a great word. Oh, oh my God. That is so awesome. I love it. I haven't really heard it being referenced too frequently. So I, yeah, I might, I might borrow that as I travel and put it into the world. I think that's fantastic. Broadway, please, because it's so powerful. It's so powerful. When you go deeper into it, it's like, how can we live in harmony and balance knowing that our bodies are already in harmony and balance? Yes. So this is kind of extension. It's an extension of Absolutely. who we are yeah. into societies and communities. Uh, but it looks like we, got, we haven't cracked the code on that at all. No, no, we're still working on that. So in your answer, I am, which is beautiful, you reference doing inner work. So for you, what does inner work look like for you? What, like, what was your experience with that to get to this point where you can you know, introduce yourself as I am without the labels? Yeah, the inner work means really going into awareness. That's the first stage. So I normally talk about three different stages of consciousness. The first one is uh, the what, the awareness. What is going on? And, and just for mm -hmm. that, we need a lot of work. Because in yes. order to get into what's going on, we have to understand all the layers and all the frames and the filters and beliefs that we have in order to see the reality. So it's not this, the what is very different to many people around the world. And that's, that's very difficult. I would say that probably uh, no, no more than 10% of the population can answer, the, can answer really the first question, which is what. And that's the first level of awareness. The second is the why. So it's like, okay, imagine that we go deep into awareness and we realize what's going on. Then the second question is about why is this going on? And that's something that probably less than 1% of the population understand because we don't have time to go into the why. 
But the third level, and that's the one that really uh, makes the difference, is the is the what for, is the transcendence. Mm, yeah. And being a coach, you know what what for is because that's the key question, right? But you know, to answer the what for, oh my goodness, you have to really uh, be in silence. So silence is the ultimate level of awareness. So I think that that's what my journey is still. Uh, I mean, still going between awareness of what, awareness of mindfulness of why, and transcendence of what for. And that's what I do every day. I try to navigate all three levels as much as I can. I love it. Yeah, it's being still, being quiet. So current day, what does your mindfulness practice look, look like? Current day is, my key technique is contemplation. So I, what I love of contemplation is you have an active mind and you, you become a witness, you become an observer. So you elevate yourself into the third, it's like the dissociation or the third person state. And then you see the world from that dissociation and third person. When you contemplate that way, you see many things, many nuances. Uh, and then you go down into first person, second person, is you try to understand the lay the layers of everybody, why do they say what they say, what are the beliefs, they are basing, and basically where they base their opinions and so on. Uh, and contemplation for me is, is my meditation practice, is my mindfulness practice, is the way where I make sense of things. And I try to do this as much as I can. I love it. Well, as a meditation teacher, I will continue to encourage you to do that. So to get that overall perspective, that overall awareness, so you can put or continue to put those positive ripples into the world. So let's talk about happiness. So before there was a World Happiness Summit and now a World Happiness Fest, can you share a little more of your backstory? What, what led you here? Like, what was your early experience like how did you see the world? Um, in essence, how did we get here? Yes, this is a great question. And, and, it's, and, and when you try to answer, you have to look into retrospective. So probably 20 years from now, maybe the answer is different. Uh, but sure. as, as of now, uh, I think that there, there are three different uh, life-changing monuments in, in, in me that got me to... Uh, the space of happiness and well-being from a strategic point of view. The first one is, I was a kid, 14, 14 years old, and I was given the opportunity to become a coach, a sports coach, handball coach. That was my sport. And in Europe, this is a big sport. And my coach told me, Luis, I need help with these kids. They were eight years old. Why don't you take care of them? I was 14 and I became a coach of kids. And I was a kid myself. So that was super cool because suddenly the first thing I realized is when we were training, we were having a lot of fun. When we were playing a game and all the parents were with the kids, that became a real mess. It's like pressure from the parents was so obvious. They wanted to, basically they were into their kids to win. And that was a, an eye-opener for me. Because it was like, oh my goodness, we're having so much fun all the time. We enjoy, but however, the external world is putting a lot of pressure on us because they want us to win when basically all of us are doing this because we like it. We love this. So that was a big uh, learning for me. And that was my positive psychology introduction into high performance because in a sports, and then I became a national coach. Uh, so I got all the training. Basically, you really focus on strengths. You focus on personal goals, collective goals. But if you see one kid that is very good doing something, you strengthen their strengths. And you focus on the character. So without knowing anything about positive psychology, we were applying positive psychology all the time. 
And that was part of the practice. So that was life-changing moment for me. So I was one seed planted in my brain. The second one, what I studied was political science, sociology, and conflict resolution, peace studies. And that was the first year of the existence of peace studies back in, in 1995. Uh, so suddenly I, I really wanted to be a diplomat and I became an international observer with the United Nations. So I was basically in post armed conflicts, bringing democracy and teaching and coaching mayors and, and after conflicts. And I think the one that was another seed for me, huge one, was the former Yugoslavia, the, the war there. And I was assigned to the Srpska Republic, which was one of the areas where there was um, a, a basically genocide of, of so many thousands and thousands of people. More than two million people were displaced or executed. And there is where I uh, met uh, many old women uh, with no family, they lost everything. And, and there was a moment one night where uh, Blikna, 85 years old woman, uh, waiting at 4 a.m. to cast her boat, uh, we, she, she was on the line and I went to her and I asked her, well, this, this is very early for you. What are you doing here? She said, well, I have hope. That's the first thing she told me. I have mm. hope. Wow. And then she kept going and he's like, I lost everything. My dogs, my family, my neighbors, all my family. But I haven't lost my hope to live in peace and to be happy one day again. So look at that, Michael. Is that through hope, peace, happiness? That's what she said. And that was back in 1997. Wow. Being there and seeing the, the disaster as we see now in Palestine, in Ukraine, in South Sudan, in Colombia, in, I mean, you name it, Mexico, is so many places where basically we have a small number of people creating so much hate and fear combined that they are shaking our souls everywhere. That was a big learning for me. And what I decided at that moment, uh, was that if I was becoming a diplomat, I wasn't going to be able to do as much. So in parallel, I was always uh, studying uh, business and marketing, and I moved into the corporate. And that was the third moment, because that moment gave me a lot of money, a lot of resources. I became the global chief brand and marketing officer of a big, big company, uh, professional services. And I had access to 175 countries. I traveled the world. And, I, and we became basically a strategic partner of the World Economic Forum. And when you are with the World Economic Forum, you, you see the, the power of frameworks. So that's when I saw that framework of economic growth, I understood that this world that we are living in today is framed for humans to be consumers. That's it. I mean, we are consumers. And when we are labeled as consumers and we are living in this capitalist system where basically... The goal is to increment and increase the level of uh, wealth and capital and the rules basically of success. So basically the basics of success is based on fame, money, and power. That's the way you want to be framing everything that you do. And that was the third moment. So at some point I was on a plane going back to New York. That's where I live and for more than 10 years. And I think that all that came together is like, oh my goodness, we are living and we are creating these systems in the world that are using us in so many ways. We get the external pressure from conditions. We are forced to live in this framework and then survive within the framework when we get all these manipulative people that know how to use confrontation, polarization, fear and hate and then we are just victims of all that stuff. So the question was, oh my goodness, I don't want to live in this world. What can we do? <laughs> and that's when I, I met many smart people and I started having conversations. And the question was, okay, if we were to create a different system for humans to flourish and for actually all species to flourish, what would that system be? That was my open question. And that was back in 90, 
97, 98, when I came back from Bosnia and I, and I joined uh, uh, the corporate world. Uh, in the end, I came out with an answer, and the answer was a new system. Yeah, and that new system is called capitalism. So it's not capital, it's capital. It's like, how do, yeah, we, happy how do you maximize yeah, the it. power of happiness? From there, I start meeting so many people around the world. And through our foundation, through Jamie, Elon, we were able to, to basically get the United Nations passing uh, the resolution of international Day of happiness. And then a lot of people around the world uh, working on positive psychology, economic behavior, neuroscientists where we're already getting together, you know, to, to talk about these things. What we did was, okay, we need to move from basically thinking and research into action. And that's when I thought, okay, how do we do this from a practical point of view? And that's when we started to create events, festivals, training and development. And, but you, as you see, the evolution is kind of very interesting even for me, because at some point you don't even realize that all that is going on in your life until you combine all those dots into something that can become a catalyst for humanity. Wow. What a look back, you know, from the early days as a 14-year-old coach, where there's the theme of play and positive psychology, and then a theme of peace, with, with both of those, there is like unbelievable connection. And now you get into the corporate world and you have this aha as you're flying back to New York to say, how do we want to be living with each other? And so that the spirit of happiness and the work that you're doing now is also about connection. So bringing this all together, like how, how, do, how can we be together and create a new system? So before we go any further, I would love your take just on what is happiness. We hear happiness a lot, social media and other places, you know, the sort of the selling of happiness. So for, for you, what, what is happiness? How would you define it? Yes, and this is, a, I feel this is a big challenge for all of us because the moment we define things, we are using our rational mind and we are yeah. putting labels to things. That's why the I am is so powerful. Mm -hmm. And then when you extend the I am to I am that I am, that becomes a mantra. And that becomes, a, a, in many ways, even the power of Shakti, of power of this feminine energy that creates and generates life. Um, so I think that I would say that for me, happiness shouldn't be defined. It has to be defined because science needs clear definitions of things in order to advance on uh, experimentation and understanding. Uh, and now science has a definition for, for happiness. So I think that for me, the way I see happiness is as a state and is energy at the same time. So it's very, very beautiful energy. Uh, and that state is a state of essence. I feel... And I believe that essence, I mean, our essence is pure happiness. Uh, when, when, we are, when we are born, before we are born, when we have that heartbeat that we can see in that fetus, where is the heartbeat coming from? I mean, that's the magic. That's the magic. Where is the first, what I call B, light force energy is coming from? And the heartbeat, that you have, that you have the first bit. Wow, that's magic. That beat has to be happiness. So that's the poo. That's the life force. Um, so that would be my definition. It's a habit. It's the first habit. And then we keep going all through our lives trying to get into that poo habit. So that's the way I want to define it. I think you, yeah, I think you did, did a great job in defining it in the Boom. I love that. The snap of the fingers like that. But but to to put a you know uh underscore to it, it, it is that energy that we feel because ultimately we're all energy, right? We we ripple out, whether it's things that are more, say, unpleasant or negative as we look at them, 
or more wanted and pleasant. I, through my recovery, through my accident, I had a little mantra, everything is neutral until you label it, Michael. So just be be patient with your labels and, and try to rest into the feelings that you're feeling, rest into the, the energy. So just be cautious about how you label things because once you label it, now you've, uh, you sort of box yourself in a bit from fully experiencing something because now you've, yeah, you've put some uh, boundaries around it. So uh, I love that. It's the poof right before the heartbeat. All right. Let's take a break. Take a full breath in and a slow releasing breath out. And relax the body as you soak up our conversation. Ah, I hope that felt good. Okay, now that we're a little bit more relaxed, can we be real? I think our morning routines, well, they've gotten a little out of control. You might not have time in the morning to meditate, because you're busy doing other things like trying to get to work or getting the kids off to school. And this is where my app, Pause, Breathe, Reflect, comes in because I built it for busy people with a whole bunch of shorter practices. So if you don't have 10 minutes in the morning to meditate, cool beans. You're human after all. But I bet you have five times throughout the day when you have two minutes to practice and let go of stress and bring mindfulness to your everyday moments. So today, download Pause, Breathe, Reflect for free and begin to stress less, sleep better, and join a community of like-hearted humans rippling something worth rippling into the world. All right, let's go back to our conversation and celebrate the Kintsugi within us all. So I'm glad you mentioned while we're going through current day. We've always had conflict and war and violence in the world, but currently, maybe because of media, social or TV or otherwise, We have access to see it all in real time. And I worry about our ability to process so much of it so quickly. So in the spirit of Kintsugi, right, we, like the Japanese art form, pottery breaks and we're able to come back together more beautifully. Scars and all, right? So we we appreciate and celebrate our scars. So I think one could say that we, we can see the cracks, we can see the breakage, we can see the loss of life through all the violence. So now we're in this position to offer more peace, the coming together, the connection piece of it, the wholeness, trying to shape ourselves into that Kintsugi vessel. So happiness is part of that. And I would love for you to share like the work that you're doing much like we st- shared up front, like I first went to the very first happiness, World Happiness Summit in Miami in 2017, and now it's so much different. The ripple's bigger. So can you share more about what goes on at the festival and you know what, what's that experience like? And I know you have another one coming up in 2024 in, in March. Yeah. So... If people wanted to come, what would they experience if they went? Well, thank you for for the for the question, and and I couldn't agree more. I think that we are exposed now to more information than ever before, and that information is always filtered through somebody's lenses. So it means that what we are getting as information is something that somebody has decided is the information they want to show. So I think that we all have to be aware that unless we are in front of the issue and we see it with our own eyes, 
and we touch it, we are seeing whatever we see through somebody else's lenses. And those lenses are going to be built on their own beliefs, perceptions. So this is very, very important that we, that we understand. So what we are trying to do with all the events that we organize, and we have another one at the United Nations University for Peace, is called Growth Global Happiness. And that's an event that actually combines peace and happiness. And that's becoming seven years, after seven years, that's becoming a huge fire pit for change makers around the world with the core of peace in it. Before we did this with roles uh, with the University for Peace, there was no training combining inner peace with, uh, with happiness. And now we have that. And then we have retreats to Bhutan where people can go deeper into their own journey of discovering happiness from an experienced point of view. So I think that what we do in Bhutan and what we do in Costa Rica at UPs are two really deep experiences for people to uh, go into their own journeys. What we are doing now with the festival is to create, basically what we say is to be happiness. So it's not to be happy, it's to be happiness. It's the embodiment of what it means to be happiness. And if somebody wants to be peace, that's great. And if somebody wants to be forgiveness, that's amazing. Because that's the same process. If you become what, what, what you want to see in the world. Already Gandhi was about talking about be the change that you want to see. In the world. What we are saying is, well, be the happiness. And, and when you become happiness, that's a different game. Because you are embodying the energy of happiness. And then you expand it. So this is so powerful. And this is what we do during the festivals. Now, uh, what we do is a lot of roundtables. So instead of having one speaker, you, we have hundreds of speakers. And they all are expanding their own insights and their own knowledge into circles. All these circles where people co-share. And in just two hours, the energy of that room is just crazy nuts because you have hundreds and hundreds of people co-creating the narrative. And that co-creation of narrative expands and expands and keeps expanding into many other circles because we all are part of maybe at least one or two or three. It's true that now we are living the worst epidemic and pandemic in the world, which is loneliness. So many people don't have any friends at all. And we have to fix that. So I think the concept of where we are building now all these interactions through the festivals is really the core of a meaningful connections. So when you build meaningful connections, that's when the ripple effect maximize. So we are transforming all our events into a co-creation of projects. So after one of the festivals, you will see that when you come in March back to Miami, because now we do Miami, but we do Spain, we do Chile, Peru, Shenzhen in China, and then we have 100 cities doing their own mini fest. We call oh, them wow. a chorus. So this is being expanding because somebody comes and says, okay, I'm back in my city, what do I do? Well, you can create your own community and you can create your own fest. Not everybody can travel uh, that far. And then COVID really put a break into a lot of traveling. So we did a lot of online. So now we combine online with physical, but it's like there is no excuse for anybody to build a meaningful, connected community. And that's the core here. How do we combine the incar incarnation of being happiness with meaningful connections? And that combination is really magic. That, I, I, love, I love hearing how it's grown. It really, really gets to the image of the ripple effect, like how how far it's rippled across the world. And for those who haven't been, and you mentioned, you know, we've talked already about how I went back in March of 2017. There is something I don't even have really the language to describe what it feels like to be in community like that. I know current day there's a lot of debate. You know, for corporate people to go back to the office or not go back to the office. And I do think there is 
some space for some flexibility. Depending on where you live, commutes can be really long and can be really exhausting and um, stressful. But there is something about being in community with each other, where we're built to be with each other, to feel that heartbeat, to feel the breathing. There's, to your point, it's magical. And you, you feel hopeful about the future. And I want to get to that in a bit, but we're going to put a pin in hopefulness, right, for a second. So besides coming to one of these festivals and participating in your work, what else can someone do to start? Because if someone's somewhere in the middle of the country, wherever country they happen to be in, and they see all this news coming onto their phones, they're scrolling social media, and they see a lot of doom and they feel overwhelmed. And they, they might wonder, and I think it's a pretty human reaction, like, God, there's so much going on. It's so big. These problems are so ginormous. What could I possibly do? And with that overwhelm, we end up doing nothing. But I'm a big believer that like, even the smallest step, even the smallest ripple, that first little raindrop matters. So what advice would you have to someone who sees what's happening in the world, they might feel overwhelmed, and they have drawn the conclusion that they can't do anything about it, this is someone else's problem to solve. What, su- what suggestions would you provide to them so they can begin yeah, this uh, I love the question, and it's so important what to do here because it's not obvious sometimes uh, when we feel overwhelmed. In this case, this is kind of what's going on in many ways. It's discourage. A lot of people feel discourage and overwhelm. It's like whatever we do, nothing is going to change. So that's that feeling of hopelessness, discourage and overwhelming. Is bad. <laughs> it's bad because it's bad depending, because it could be good. You can manage it, right? Because that ge- they can sue it in many ways. That, that, that's going to be the scar. And we know that from post-traumatic growth, that actually there is as much growth after trauma than stress. But, but what is true is that when you are in the feeling of overwhelm, discourage, and hopelessness, that's bad. That's really, the, the feeling is terrible. So what do we do? Well, the, that's where consciousness comes. And the first time is to be aware that you are overwhelmed, that you feel discouraged, and you feel hopeless. So you have to be aware. It's like, that's how I feel. And you have to put those names into the feeling. And some people are going to go there. They're going to say, I feel sad. That's it. It's like, because in sadness, we incorporate all this emotional stuff that we don't know how to use. So there are more than 300. I mean, there are thousands, but at least we have words for between 300 and 500 super defined emotions and feelings. So we have to explore that range of emotions and feelings. And that's the first step. The second is to understand, and this is what Christine Neff's uh, called shared humanity. And this is what so important in, in Buddhism as well, is like, we all suffer. We all suffer. We acknowledge that there is suffering. So you acknowledge, and you acknowledge that we all suffer. And right now, we all, all every human being, this is the first time in humanity that we all suffer the same pandemic. Eight billion people in the world went through the same feeling in many ways. So right now what we are all suffering is eco-anxiety, ecological anxiety. It goes into the, the social brain. And this is coming through the subconscious And we all are contemplating and feeling all this eco-anxiety that is not going to stop. Because the more 
access we have to information and the more polarization is increasing in the world, the more we are going to be exposed to all this anxiety. So what it means is that we have to be very aware that this is a common, common shared issue among all humanity. Once you put a label, it's like, okay, I'm aware I'm suffering. The second one, we all suffer. The third one is, what is the path to get out of suffering? And, and that's where we have to use techniques and meditation and mindfulness and contemplation and breathing techniques, meaningful connections, journaling, being in nature, swimming, eating chocolate. I mean, that's where we have to get yeah, into, into the activation yeah. of our happiness. Because the beautiful space, and this is a beautiful world, is happiness is in us. We are seeds. And as seeds, with the right soil, with the right water, with the right temperature, with the right light, with the right care, we are going to flourish. And we are going to become the palm, the melon, the, the pine, the... Whatever any, I mean, whatever flower, row we want to become, but we need the right conditions. And we need to acknowledge that we are the seed and happiness is in us. So that's when we acknowledge all this going on. Then we have to go into the activation and we have to be very aware about what activates my happiness. Because that's the way I'm going to be working on my own happiness. That's the way I'm going to be working on my own peace. So what activates peace in me? What activates hope? What activates happiness? Once we start understanding that there is technique number one, two, three, four, that's the way, that's when I'm going to be focusing on using them. But you, you know how beautiful it is? We activate it. So the same way that we got the first light in our hearts and we got the first heartbeat, now we can go back into the power of that light, of that energy, and we can activate it through many different ways. And one of them is basically stop watching news, but understanding that we are responsible for bringing joy and happiness and peace to the world, because that's the way we are really going to change the, the dynamic. If we see violence and we bring more violence, that's, the, that's it. You you bring violence to violence. If you see violence, you bring peace, you balance. And this is so tough for humans because we have a strong ego and we have a strong sense of pride and we have a strong sense of survival. We'd rather kill everything around us to survive than actually being conscious and integrating the suffering and diluting the suffering in a smart way because we don't know how to do this because we are not conscious. So I think that we are run by a bunch of fools, like the Bee Gees were saying in the sun. We are basically run by a bunch of fools that don't realize the only thing we have to do is to be you and me and love each other. That's it. All we need is love. All we need is love. I love that. Oh, so many... So many multiple mic drops in that last passage that you shared. Like what I heard playing it back is just awareness, um, acceptance that we all suffer, and then understanding what makes us feel happiness, compassion, peacefulness. And then you put that ripple out into the world. So we take a different path. The easy path is to keep scrolling, to keep on getting upset and to lean into our righteousness and our ego that the way we see the world is the right way. Or we can take a step back, open up our awareness, uh, get high as you said in your contemplation practice and just look around and see that everyone is experiencing everything through their own lens. And then from there, we can actually be very intentional. So it's our intention and also our attention 
to put more compassion, kindness, peace, love into the world. And when someone else receives that ripple, then they might be in a better state of mind, a better state of awareness or consciousness to do that as well. So small ripples combined together, uh, the analogy or the visual is can create a big wave. And we need a big wave of compassion and happiness in this world to uh, counterbalance the fools, as you would say, who are trying to run the world as they see fit so they can have more power and fame and status. Wow. I sign on that. I love it. Yes. So let's make it. We're going to make it happen. <laughs> we're going to make this happen. So uh, I love it. So a couple of different things uh, before we wrap up. So mindfulness to me is medicine. Yes. I also think movement is medicine. Yes. So as a maybe a current handball player or a former handball player. So how do you like to move? Oh, I love it. Now I like beach tennis. Beach tennis. Oh, wow. I love it. And it's because I know I played tennis for a long time. But now when you get above uh, an age, you want, and you want <laughs> to be in nature, uh, actually beach tennis is so beautiful. I, got, I, I, I was introduced to it by a, a really good friend in Dubai. Uh, traveling there and, and actually creating there the chapter for the World Happiness Foundation. And since then, I've been uh, practicing and it's beautiful because you are, uh, you are basically walking and running on sand by the water, wow. by the water. Yeah. And you are, you are, you feel that you are doing exercise, but you can manage the, the, basically the, your heart and you can, manage the heartbeat as well and you can manage the intensity. So I think that I, I love it. And then the other thing that I discover and because I want to challenge myself a lot is Zumba. Zumba is dancing, is 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 cool. And I became a Zumba instructor just to understand No way, really? Oh that's so awesome. That's but that's basic I'm really bad dancing, but I wanted to see the the method and the strategy behind. And uh, you know, it's I know very well the founder uh, and and the and, um, and the whole team there, and is uh, and now we have many opportunities to dance. But I think that's one of the structure uh, sports created, combining low heartbeat. So actually, you can play with that, but it's really sustained. It's like yoga that you normally go to sixty percent. So Zumba is one of those sports now that brings you joy every hour that you really practice. Is beautiful. So movement. I agree with you. There are many other ways of movement, but for me, movement is dancing. I love, and trying to do as much as possible. And then now, right now, is beach beach tennis. I love it. So you set me up for the next question. So besides movement is medicine and mindfulness is medicine, I believe music is medicine. So it could be Zumba music, but is there an artist or a band? or a song that will make you move like no other song or maybe bring you happiness when you hear it? Yeah, there are many. I just came from Colombia. You know, in Colombia, bachata is very important. And, and there I was in front of hundreds of women who are basically moving from plan B to plan A. It's a beautiful community that is really powerful women that at some point they want to change their life because they gave so much already to the corporate world that they want to go into something that gives them more freedom. But it's, it's not easy because you have to transition into a new life. So I was there and I closed the van and everybody ended up dancing. One song that I love and it's called eh, Corazoncito Bonito, which is beautiful heart. And it's all about love, love, love. So if you repeat love and love and love, but it's bachata. So that's, I, I love it. Um, but then the, the I mean, the many, many things. I love Nora Jones. Nora Jones is my, is my medicine. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I like, yeah. Oh, that's so awesome. Oh, great stuff. I love it. <laughs> All right. We're going to finish up on this question. So in every loving kindness meditation that I lead, 
I have this phrase, may be heard, may be seen, may you be loved. So in this moment, I want to invite you to use your voice so people can hear you and you can share where people can see your work so they can love you even more. <laughs> so where would you send them? Welcome to a website, worldhappiness.foundation. So we are a non-for-profit. We are a for-purpose organization. That's what we are called ourselves, foundation. So it's the foundation of world happiness. So how do we create the, the big anchors and small anchors and the ripple effect to get to world happiness? So this is worldhappiness.foundation. And there you can see the festival, the academy. We have an incredible chief well-being officer program. We are training hundreds and hundreds of people that are bringing happiness and well-being to uh, cities, to schools, and to business, and, and everything is there. Well, happiness.foundation. Mm. Louise, thank you. I love you and what you're doing and the world. The world needs more people like you. And so thank you for putting a beautiful ripple into it. I appreciate that. What you do is very important. And the energy and everything and yourself, just yourself bringing uh, all this wisdom uh, together, We're talking about resilience, talking about how we can make beauty out of suffering is, is what we need. So thank you so much for what you're doing and thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. Don't you just love Luis's energy? He is happiness. As he said, be happiness. I'm sure you took many things away from our conversation with Luis. Here are three things I did. One, the value of inner work. So you can get to know who you truly are beyond the labels. And as you do this inner work, to be mindful of the labels you use. So you can be more aware. You can see things from new perspectives. And you just might see that a new system is what's needed, whether that be on a global scale or just you as an individual. Sometimes we need a new system because if nothing changes, well then, nothing changes. All right, here's number two. When I first met Louise in 2017, there were maybe three, 400 people at the World Happiness Summit. And now look what he's built. He would probably say, look at what we built. It's now a global movement of happytalism. So that small ripple in Miami back in 2017 has now become a wave. It's now a powerful force for positive change throughout the world. How cool is that? And here's number three. Love, sweet love. All we need is love. There's a lot of darkness and hate in the world. And more hate only ends up giving us more hate. We need more love in the world. We need more love in the world so we can heal, so we can come together more peacefully and come into the wholeness that is our Kintsugi spirit. So again, I hope you enjoyed this week's conversation about resilience with Luis Gallardo. I hope you'll check out his resources and give him a follow. And maybe I'll see you at the World Happiness Summit come March of 2024. Also, I'd like to give a shout out to the like-hearted humans at SASPod that make the Kintsuki podcast sound so great and help it ripple into all corners of this big blue marble that we all share. And now, I want to thank you 
for listening and supporting the Kintsugi podcast. And if you want to go above and beyond in your support, I could certainly use a kind rating, a review, subscribing, or sharing because it does something to the algorithm that I don't completely understand. But when you engage in this way, it helps others find our like-hearted community. If you've already done so, thank you for the extra support. And if you haven't done so yet, today might be a really good day to do so. And if you'd like to receive some additional resources that can help you connect with yourself and others, like my Better Life Workbook and the inspirational text messages I send throughout the week, and of course, our Pause, Breathe, Reflect meditation app, I'll put those links in our show notes. And remember, between now and next week's story of connection, when you have a challenging moment, Slow down and back to your breath. I know that you've got this and we've got you. And together, we will ripple something worth rippling into the world. I love you for listening and I hope to see you next week. Until then, toodaloo.